like to welcome Jurgen Urbanski. Um, Jurgen is the VP of Growth at Silicon Valley Data Science, and if you look at through his uh, his resume um, and bio, you'll see that he's been the CTO at Deutsche Telekom. Has also worked, I think, at McKinsey, Microsoft. Where else in here? Plenty, actually, isn't there? NetApp. It's a sign of age. A sign of age. That's right. Um, and uh, and and in the spirit of uh, of I think just sort of great communication, don't you love a good title for a presentation? So kind of popular ways to fail on the path to creating value with data. We can all kind of nod at that, I'm sure. Um, so without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Jurgen. Thank you. Thank you, and a special thanks goes to Jeffrey Yao. Um, Jeffrey did a tremendous job accelerating growth at Silicon Valley Data Science, and he's also here on the faculty at Berkeley. And this talk here is about what they probably don't teach at Berkeley. You, you all can be the judge. You, you can tell me at the end of this is being taught or not, but my personal journey with Hadoop and the big data ecosystem started back in 2012. And here we are more than five years later. The number one thing that surprises me is how few companies, how few organizations truly are successful on a big scale with big data. And I wanted to share some of those lessons, lessons that I've learned personally, lessons that we have learned as a firm at Silicon Valley Data Science. We're a data science and data engineering consulting boutique focused on building data products, focused on building data-driven businesses, and generally speaking, focused on helping organizations accelerate their data and digital journey. So um, audience participation, participation question, what is the simplest way to make sure that you are successful well, don't fail, and I'm here to talk about some of the ways that people are failing. Obviously, jokes aside, failure is good. You want to fail early and often. You want to fail in small ways. You want to learn and experiment from that. But what I'm going to share here is a couple of really big insights on how companies fail in big ways. And gee, it would be great to avoid that in any organization that you go into. And so that's what my talk's about. Many companies have high aspirations, high aspirations for the value they create with data. We're all familiar with the Silicon Valley data machines. You can see some of the logos here. There are many, many more out there. And what stands out in all of these companies are two things, probably more than two things, but the two things I want to highlight. Number one is if you think about the business model of these companies, Google, Facebook, Airbnb, Uber, many others, they're fundamentally they're fundamentally data science machines. They're fundamentally well-oiled machines that are all about one thing, extracting superior value from the data that they have about consumers and about the world at large. And that is richly rewarded by investors and by the world at large. If you look at the enterprise value, the valuation that these companies have per employee, it turns out that Statistically, every single employee is worth several million dollars, not their personal worth, uh, unfortunately, but the worth in which they contribute to the value of the enterprise. So uh, how can you be the next Silicon Valley data machine? Well, if we look at the enterprises at large, notably outside of Silicon Valley, there's a lot of disappointment when it comes to creating real, tangible, sizable value from data science and from data at large. Um, this is one study, recent study by Gartner. Gartner is a research and consulting firm, and they interviewed several hundred technology leaders and business leaders. And they asked the question, where are you in your journey, in the journey of creating business value from data? And you can see that only 15% of respondents said, I have big data in production, it is deployed, it's running smoothly, and most everyone else is at various stages of piloting, experimenting, figuring out what their strategy should be. Now, experimentation is a great thing. It's on the path to value. You do a proof of concept, you do a proof of value, 
you do a prototype, you're experimenting before you go full, uh, you know, you, before there's a, a bigger bang, if you will, in terms of rolling things out. But it is kind of a little bit surprising that in year, you know, six or seven or eight of the data revolution, a relatively small percentage of organizations are truly deployed and truly in production. And that, of course, suggests that the percentage of those that get big value is even less than 15%, because not everyone that has stuff up and running gets the value that they, realize, that, they, that they hope to get out of it. And you can then ask the question, well, why is that? That's kind of a little weird. What's, what's going on here? Gartner also asked, well, who is driving that journey in your organization? Our company, Silicon Valley Data Science, was approached by a CIO recently. And the CIO literally came to us saying, well, I spent uh, more than $10 million in the last uh, three years on my data journey, $10 million that I invested in software and hardware, in uh, services, and I don't have any business value to show for it right now. What's, what's wrong in this picture? And so what you can see in this study, let me kind of clear the chart for you. Gartner basically said, well, which function in your organization initiated the data journey? which function funded it, which function then took the, the key technology decisions, and which function uh, you know, led the overall effort. And what you can see here is somewhat unfortunate. The CIO, the chief information officer, is the number one function. And uh, that is not to say that this is a problem always by definition, but it does point to a pattern. It points to a pattern that all too often, the technology, it's a technology-led initiative to get value out of the data, as opposed to a business-led initiative or more of a joint endeavor, endeavor between technology and the business. And you can also see that, you know, fortunately, the business unit heads here, this was the second most common function. But you can see that the chief data officer, whose task it ought to be to drive this, is kind of an also-ran function probably because a lot of organizations have just created a role of a chief data officer. Okay, so there's a little bit of an insight here. Um, our firm actually went out to some of the leading companies in the US to collect some new thinking on how to be successful with data. And that thinking uh, comes from a large number of interviews. You can see here some of the headshots of the folks we interviewed. Uh, there's a free book which you can download. I'll share the link at the end. But what we learned from those chief data officers is that the tech is not the problem. The technology is not the problem. It's really around prioritizing what you do, aggregating the data across various silos, and broadly speaking, orchestrating what's a multi-year journey. That's really the big challenge. And so prioritizing Typically, that's done with, via what we call a data strategy. And that was exactly the problem that the CIO had who came to us because he actually didn't have a data strategy. It was a technology-led platform build that was disjointed from the actual business needs and the business priorities. And so one way to prioritize what to do with data is to say, okay, well, let me think about what the organization wants to do strategically. If you're a retailer, that might be around, okay, I want to compete with Amazon, I want to compete with online generally, or I want to compete with some no-frills, no low-cost competitors. That might be in a strategic imperative. You then go down and say, okay, well, what does that actually mean? What are your specific business objectives? Well, it might be things like, um, I want to increase the productivity of my physical point of sale in terms of sales per square foot per, per month. You know, you go down to very specific objectives. And then you say, okay, well, to do that, what kind of data do I need? What are, the, what are the data sources I would like to have, both internal data sources as well as stuff that comes from the world at large, including some of the sensors we heard about in the GE talk? And what, what about the, the quality, the freshness, the availability, the depth, et cetera, of those data sources? And from that, you basically then, you know, mapping this against what you have today, you really derive ultimately a roadmap. And so one retailer for which we did this recently, we literally surfaced 130 use cases, not all of those equally important, of course. 
and then translated that to a more modular 30-odd uh, technical workloads, technical building blocks, architectural building blocks that they could now build out in order to serve some of those priority use cases. So that is an example of how uh, you essentially bridge the business technology gap by defining a roadmap that's actionable, that is clear, and that is prioritized. The second piece, of course, is to fight the silos. Most companies have a large number of internal data silos, and one of the key organizational tasks when you come into an organization as a newly appointed data leader, whether your title is chief data officer or something else, but you're in charge for making it happen, is to break up those silos and essentially establish a shared service of sorts that serves a large number of business units, a large number of use cases. And that takes a lot of heavy lifting in terms of convincing people. And then thirdly, there is this notion of orchestration and evangelization. If you think about a lot of the chief data officer teams in companies, even very large companies, they tend to be somewhat small, 20, 30, 40, 50 people. And the question becomes, well, how do you really orchestrate this journey? How do you accelerate this journey? How do you drive change in an organization that might be a thousand times bigger? And here the the image, the metaphor of the central nervous system is a good one. If you think about our nervous system, the nervous system doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't have any muscles, but it is a sensor networks of sorts. And building out such a sensor networks of sorts is a key part of the task of being successful because you're trying to drive frontline decision making for let's say 30,000 colleagues uh, enabling them with a small team of perhaps 30 or so that might be responsible for uh, data. And of course, these numbers are illustrative, but just to say that it's several orders of, you know, you're trying to drive change in an organization that's several orders of magnitude bigger than the small number of folks that are truly at the core of this journey, the data engineers, the data scientists, et cetera. So let's come to the core part of this talk, which is around challenges and pitfalls. And my observations are a poor, there are four sort of most popular ways to fail. And it's just kind of good to be cognizant of these failure patterns, not to fall on the same trap. One is a failure to really motivate and mobilize your organization for what is a multi-year journey. Uh, here I'm kind of assuming that you have an organization that's somewhat large with thousands and thousands of people. If you have a 10 person company, then that effort is a lot more straightforward. The second problem is the last mile problem. The third problem is excessive bureaucracy. And the fourth problem is outsourcing a core competency. So I'm gonna spend a couple minutes talking you through each and how to avoid these patterns. And we'll come to some conclusions towards the end of the talk. The first here is really around motiva motivating and mobilizing your organization for change. So typically what happens in these large firms when a new chief data officer is, is appointed or similar titles, you know, chief digital officer, which suggests a slightly more business focused view. Typically what happens is the, the CEO, the board has incredibly grand aspirations for what data can do because they read the popular press, they, wa you know, they watch, you know, uh, the uh, you know, business uh, television channels, uh, et cetera. Hopefully they don't watch Fox News, but some apparently do. Um, anyway, so they see these popular examples and they're like, wow, now this is, we wanna fly to the moon and this is our aspiration. What they don't realize is how messed up, how siloed, how disparate, how poor quality their existing data assets are. And so if you are coming into this, you kinda have to play at both ends of the spectrum. You have to play to the, the vision and it requires quite a bit of evangelization and getting people excited about the journey. But there's also a lot of heavy lifting because really what you're doing is sort of akin to an industrial revolution. If you think about the industrial revolution, that didn't happen overnight. Uh, frankly, it took many, many decades to make that happen. Uh, these days, everything happens faster, but Clearly, it's going to be a multi-year journey. Typically, there's a platform investment up front to establish a 
data platform that ingests all these data sources, more and more sources over time, and that then serves those up in intelligent ways to the business, but you kind of have to then articulate why you're making a platform investment for what's initially a small number of uh, use cases. And you know, so the, the beginning can be really hard. And in that sense, driving the data revolution is sort of the art of the possible, right? You have to get tactical uh, quick wins. You have to get some showcases. You have to get people excited. Uh, you know, you have to sort of appeal to the emotional part about the excitement, but you also, in parallel, have to do some of the heavy lifting. And if you don't get that mix right, then uh, bad things happen. For instance, if you're too internally focused on the heavy lifting of establishing the data platform, the data governance, the data quality, but you don't have things to show back to the business, at some point, either the funding gets cut or your head gets chopped off because they're saying, whoa, you spent 10, 20 million dollars, where is the business value? So that's a very delicate balance. And likewise, sometimes when folks go into these change leadership roles, they kind of flame out after you know, a year or so because it requires quite a bit of frustration tolerance. You have to have the longer, longer term view, but you also have to bring people along perhaps in some old school organization. So you have to be tolerant of some of the, the politics and the, you know, you have, to you have to have a certain frustration tolerance in order to sustain this journey over a longer period of time. The second problem is what I might call a last mile problem. And so uh, in, your, in your time here at Berkeley, you've probably heard about the data value chain. The data value chain in principle is pretty straightforward. You discover the right data sources, you ingest them, there's processing, there's a persistence layer, you integrate stuff, and then you analyze things. That's where the data science comes in. Um, and then you expose that out to the business. The challenge is that typically, if you look at the organizational remit of these chief data officer roles or data leader roles, they, they often do not span the end of the data value chain. So let me give you an example from a large telco I worked with. Um, uh, it's essentially an example where the data science team produced great insights, and they were not just descriptive, but they were getting towards being predictive. Uh, they were not just used by the management team for things like segmentation and, and pricing, but they were really useful for the front line in terms of what's the next best action for a specific customer at a specific point in time, right? Do you offer a bundle? Do you offer a promotion? Do you offer a win back, uh, a promo, et cetera? And so that was all great, but there was really a last mile gap because the chief data officer, you know, so what does it take for these insights to make it to the front line of an organization? The point of sale, a contact center, the shop floor, uh, you know, the cockpit, you name it, whatever the front line is of your organization. Well, it typically requires for those insights to be consumed by an application that the front line person is using, maybe in a retail point of sale. Uh, it may require some app dev, it may require some application integration. It surely will require some training, and frankly, it also often requires process changes or changes to the incentives of the frontline folks. And so that often, that's often the issue, that there's this last mile gap, and the solution is not necessarily to broaden the scope of a CDO's role, but the solution is to make sure that everyone from the top down is really bought into this journey so that the person who runs store operations or the person who runs the whatever manufacturing shop for that they are motivated and incented and they get it and they are doing their part to make those insights consumable at the edge of the organization. So that's a very top, very typical problem. And to do this well, you basically need to master a range of capabilities. Um, there are w different ways to describe the capabilities that are needed, but suffice to say that it's essentially a spectrum of capabilities that spans both the technology side as well as the business side. And if you take any given one of these 
um, out of the equation, then things break down, or at least you're not achieving the success at the scale that you would like. The third one, and uh, forgive my, my wordiness on the slides, is essentially excessive bureaucracy, right? So, uh, you know, everything has a yin and a yang, so why is process important? Why is bureaucracy important? Companies have been very, companies have gotten very sophisticated over the years with respect to managing the two key things that they have. One is the talent, and the other one is the money. And that sophistication is totally breaking down here in the world of big data. Let me give you two examples. Let's talk money first. Show me the money. Um, so in way too many organizations I have seen, if you are coming in as a data leader, you're trying, for instance, to make the case why a data platform is important, you're trying to make the case why we're investing in data science capabilities, or why data science is being brought to a specific use case, you basically need money for that, you need funding. And I've seen way too many CFOs, uh, chief financial officers, who say, well, what exactly is the ROI of this platform investment? Um, what exactly are you gonna find with your data science effort? Show me the ROI, right? And that is completely nonsensical. That's as nonsensical as saying, oh, you're introducing an accounting system, accounting software. I know this is very 1970s or 80s, but what's the ROI of an accounting software? Well, I know, we, we have money in the company, we're trying to count it better, that's the ROI. Same thing, <laughs> right? Same thing here with, with data, and so often, so, so the, the, the folks that are driving the journey are used to agile ways of working, they're used to experimentation, they're kind of working in the Silicon Valley ways of working that we're used to here, but they have to then tell a story and make an argument to people that are in a very old school, sequential, waterfall way of thinking, and we all know that when you are engaged in data science, it's ultimately an exploratory activity. You don't know what you're gonna find. The data sources may be terrible. There may be zero insight in the data sources, or you may have to invest more to cultivate and get better data sources. I mean, we just don't know. And so the spirit of experimentation, the spirit of agile is very often at odds with how money is allocated. And similarly, it's often at odds with how talent gets brought into organizations. If you look at a lot of organizations, talent usually, every job is usually s sort of sized and skilled such that the least skilled person can do the job, right? That's the, the essence of Taylorism over the last, whatever, 100 odd years. You wanna make a job as simple as possible so the lowest paid person can do the job and it's very Tayloristic and it's very siloed. But that's totally the wrong way to go about something that is emerging, that is high growth, that sees a high rate of experimentation and innovation like data science. Think about the role of a data scientist and the many, many skills that need to come together from the creativity and the curiosity and the tenacity all the way to the hardcore quantitative skills. Uh, likewise, think about the role of a chief data officer uh, who combines both a deep appreciation of the technology and a deep appreciation of the business. And so to kind of cut to the chase here, I see way too many organizations that are saying, well, you're bringing in a whatever manager, director level person, that person can only make so much money because that's, you know, we have our pay bans, et cetera. And in a hot market like, day, like, like we're in right now and with a hot talent and skill set, it's often very difficult for these leaders to hire the right kind of talent because of the way that roles are typically scoped in organizations. And then finally, outsourcing as a core competency. This one is very prevalent if you go to the middle of the country or to the uh, East Coast, perhaps a little bit less prevalent here in Silicon Valley, but very often we find that large enterprises rely predominantly on their ex existing large system integration houses, the ones that serve them on, on, on all sorts of you know, application development, application management, uh, call center outsourcing, what have you, 
and often there's a lot of offshore uh, in that delivery when, when they are basically being served by these SIs. Um, others rely more on individual contractors, so maybe it's not large SIs, but it's armies and armies of essentially uh, contractors. And the challenge with this overall model is that your knowledge walks out of the door every evening, uh, folks don't really have skin in the game, and hence the, you know, the, the desire, the admonishment, if you will, to build out a capability in-house. You know, if we're saying data is the, you know, one of the top three or four production factors, data is the new gold, et cetera, the new oil, well, you have to build out capabilities in-house, and it's fine if you rely on a third party, uh, if you're coming in as a new leader, you don't have a team, you need to show results in 90 days, okay, fine, get someone in to help you, but make sure that if you are getting in a third party, a consulting firm, that that firm builds your knowledge, builds your capabilities, helps you hire the right people, helps you establish the right culture, the right processes, et cetera, so that you're really becoming self-sufficient and you're not dependent on you know, a, on, on, on a third party for something that ought to be a core competency. At that point, organizations say, okay, well, we're gonna hire a CDO, a chief data officer, and then the problem is solved. <laughs> and there are really two flavors of this, uh, a small CDO and a big CDO. The small CDO is really not a role that I would recommend any of you take. It's really someone who is a data steward, who looks after data quality, data governance, et cetera, exclusively, but is disconnected from the business. The big CDO really is someone who's part of the executive team who really says, look, data is not you know, a good in its own right. Data is there to create value for the business, to serve customers better, to delight employees, et cetera. And so, that's really the kind of role that we see being more successful a chief data officer who is core part of the management team who really looks at data with a view towards creating business value. Um, that begs the question, this is I think the second to last slide, where should such a person report into? Clearly the best reporting relationship in general tends to be the CEO, but we see all of these flavors here out there in the wild with pros and cons. If it reports to the CFO, it tends to be overly focused on risk and compliance. If it you know, reports into the marketing person, the CMO, tends to be overly focused on the customer intimacy use cases and maybe neglect some of the operational use cases. And if it reports into the CIO, it tends to not necessarily be business facing, but there's sort of a layer in between what's happening in the data organization and the actual business. And uh, finally, the personal qualities of someone who's, who, t uh, if we look at the folks who tend to be successful in this role, it's a little bit like a white unicorn, right? There are folks that have deep appreciation for the business side, but also understand the technology pretty deeply. There are folks who bring a lot of change leadership and energy and evangelization into an organization, but also are fairly diplomatic because you have to say no an awful lot of times, even though people don't realize it's a really a no because their use case may not be the top priority right at the moment. Um, that kind of brings us to the end of the talk and um, wanted to thank you for your attention. We do have time for questions and while we take questions, a lot of the learnings are encapsulated in the free book that I mentioned up front so you can download this and uh, obviously we're always, I'm always here to take any any questions? I would like to understand the problem number one. So you mentioned that the, the newer challenge is uh, getting the investment for the uh, data platform, uh, which is expensive. And then you also mentioned that the challenge to prove the quick win or business case, right? Mm -hmm. But for me, I, I find it difficult to understand why the quick win have to go with a big investment for the data platform. I mean, quick win and POC should be sure. like go with like 
fifty dollars the uh, yep. cheap. Uh, for example, you, you, you go with a, a cloud, right? You can easily spin up whatever mm -hmm. uh, big data platform you want, and sure. then uh, proof uh, quick win, and then you you go from there. Right? You don't have to yeah, go so, with big investment right. and, 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 and and POC. So it's uh, not necessarily that those two are linked, but you're ultimately trying to show value quickly. Obviously, using the cloud, using open source, etc. But at the back of your mind, you have to realize it's a multi-year journey. If you're a large company, it's going to take several million dollars to truly set up this capability that serves various parts of your business. And so you have to, so in other words, you have to incrementally show value. You want to show value early and often. Cloud and open source, etc., are great. You know ways of doing that in a capital efficient manner. That's great, but at the at the back of your mind, you have to know that it, for this to be successful on a large scale, it is a multi year journey. It typically t takes several million dollars. You know, ten million for a large organization would not be too high of a number. But you're not going to get a ten million dollar check the day you join. So you need to always show. Every quarter, there's a use case or two that go live, and they're in the cloud, and that's great. But over time, you're building out your team, and you're building out a data platform. And yes, very often, we find typically people do this in the cloud, and it's cloud first. And in most situations, it should be. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a perception and expectations management exercise. Yeah, what I mean is that you don't have to present with a $10 million investment plan in the first place? Right. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Maybe next question? I just wanted to know the difference between uh, CDO and CIO. Sure. Uh, and I, I might also throw the chief digital officer in there. So the <laughs> typically what we, so uh, diff, you know, so different organizations call similar roles by different names, right? But by and large, the chief information officer tends to be a role that focuses on the plan, design, and build part of IT, right, uh, in terms of both the infrastructure and the applications. And companies have come to realize that that's often not ensuring sufficient focus just on the data domain. So they created a chief data officer, and he or she is responsible for making sure that data are truly used like a production factor. You're, you're collecting as much data as you can because the marginal cost of that is very low. More importantly, you're trying to get insights out of that data and serve it to the business. And sometimes that rep re role reports to the CIO. More often than not, it doesn't. And then finally, you have the emergence of the chief digital officer that tends to be a little bit more business focused by design focusing on things like you know, cloud and mobile and sometimes analytics as part of the chief digital officer domain. So there's different flavors, but by and large, that's what I see out there in the wild. Okay. Time for, Hello. oh yes, in the back, yes, sir. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> can, you, can you distinguish between the failure points that you talk about in this particular uh, presentation as distinct from some of the Past phenomenon, for example, in the early 90s, there was a big buzz about ERP, then at the turn of the century, internet, then you had cloud, and every organization, it seems like it's a deja vu. They go through the same movie again. The CIO or somebody, head honcho, gets excited, oh, machine learning, we are going to use artificial intelligence and everything. So this seems like uh, something that kind of periodically repeats itself. The cycle might be kind of compressing. What specific points about data science projects that you can relate. I mean, I didn't get a complete sense of what specific to data science we are talking about because it seems like these are very valid points. They happen in all the organization and they happen all the time. Every time there is a new buzz because they don't have the capability, they get somebody from outside, maybe McKinsey or some of these because they have big names and they have they serve as a justification for whatever initiative they have. And the second point I had was about the ROI part um, because CFOs, etc., they are not really glued to the technology. At the end of the day, they have to justify to whoever it is, they want to look at the bottom line. So why do you think it's a, probably not a good idea for companies to do that? Because ultimately, they have to justify it to the shareholders or whoever powers that be. And they have to break it down into the lowest common denominator, which is, what is my ROI? What am I getting out of this, right? Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to address the second point first. Um, I think if you. 
So, uh, right, so people want to get a return from their investment, and by and large, they tend to produce a return from data science investments, but the fallacy is to pretend that you know ahead of time what the return will be. So anytime your funding is contingent upon a deterministic view of the return, and something that is as new, as experimental, as exploratory as a lot of this work is, you basically have to tell a lie because you don't know, you know, is your data any good? Uh, you know, can those insights make it to the front line of the organization or is there a last mile gap that we talked about? So the pretension that there is a deterministic ROI is usually a fallacy and hopefully your organization doesn't require you to tell that story in that way. Um, the first question you addressed was more, you asked was more around the you know, some of the hype cycle, right? And so we see a couple of different patterns, and I'll tell you how we address that as well. One pattern we see is someone picks up a buzzword somewhere, you know, maybe in the popular press, and they're saying, oh, I want to do deep learning and cognitive this, and I want to do AI and machine learning, et cetera. And when you peel back the onion, because usually the folks that then get excited about this more often than not, they don't truly understand the subject matter. Uh, when you peel back the onion, it turns out that maybe, you know, like data science, as you know, is, a, is, a, it's a, is, a, is an array of different approaches and tools, and the one that's stuck in their mind may not be the right one to solve a specific business problem, right? And so the way we, do, we deal with this is to always anchor it in it. What are you trying to do for the business? You're trying to delight customers. You're trying to retain employees and make them more productive. You're trying to whatever, increased quality and safety. And so anchored in that business problem, we can usually walk them back from something that is just a you know, random idea they picked up in the Wall Street Journal and come back to, well, you know, an expert data scientist would look at the following you know, methods and tools and whatever buzzword they picked up may or may not be part of that set, right? Okay, great, Jurgen, thanks so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.